friends, it's Jasmine, and I hope that you all have been doing well. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I am a witchy content creator amongst other things, and you can find all of my links down below if you are interested in keeping up with me. And if you are a returning subscriber, Welcome back, it's good to see you here, and I'm really excited to get into today's video. It's actually kind of partially inspired by this hashtag trend that's kind of been going around on YouTube, which I did participate in. I highly recommend that you check out the tag because there's so many amazing creators that I have been able to come across that I might have not been able to because of algorithms and whatnot, and the power of a hashtag can really bring communities together so much. And when I was watching some of the videos on hashtag occultee, I came across two creators in particular that definitely inspired some of this video. Now, I do want to say that this is not necessarily like a video response to either of these creators, more so along the lines of things that they talked about, I was inspired by uh, to make a video. So today's video is going to be all about men in the craft, which is a topic that I feel like cycles up every few years or so, at least in my sphere. And I'm excited to talk about it, to share my thoughts about it. Um, you know, I did a podcast episode on my old, old podcast. For those of you who have been following me for a while, you might remember the As the Cauldron Bubbles podcast, where I interviewed Michael Buddha on men in the craft in an episode. And I will be linking that episode down below in the description if you are interested in listening to us talk about this very topic in that podcast episode. The two creators videos that um, kind of helped inspire this video was Nico Katos, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Aiden Darling. Like I said, both of those creators very much inspired me to touch on this topic again, because as I was listening to their occult videos, one thing that I really took away from was this sort of word of representation and what representation means. And keep in mind, this video, again, is not necessarily a criticism, nor is it a video response to either of these creators. More so, they just kind of inspired me to talk more about this topic, as it has been a few years since I've talked about it. And I think it's a really good topic to discuss because I find that their sentiments in their videos of feeling left out or overlooked or not included um, as male identifying people or as men um, in witchcraft spaces and feeling sort of left out is definitely a common narrative that I have heard from many men, um, not just these two creators. So any criticisms that I bring up in regard to this topic are in no way directed at those specific creators. I just want to make that clear perfectly. Um, and I just want to share my thoughts about this in general. I completely understand the need for representation. As a trans woman myself, I have also often encountered spaces or people in the pagan community or in the craft community that do either intentionally or unintentionally make me feel excluded, unwanted, whatever the case might be. And that has definitely been its own journey, along with my transition, also the journey of being a trans femme witch out in the world and in this community completely relate to feeling excluded, feeling like there's a lack of representation. And I definitely want to say that I am a big subscriber to if you see a need, fill a need, if you know what I mean. And that's definitely been my philosophy when it comes to the craft in general. Fortunately, if you feel like there is a lack, I think that you are kind of being called to step up and fulfill that. And I know that that's not everyone's responsibility and not everyone can necessarily be a trailblazer or what have you. Maybe they don't have the spoons or the resources or whatever. But for myself as a trans woman in the craft, like that's very much what I have felt like I've had to do. When I first came on to the pagan scene, you know, in my early 20s, I felt like there were 
were many tables that I was unwelcome at simply because I am a trans woman. And instead of that pushing me out of the craft altogether, it actually called me even further in towards it and led me to create my own fucking table. So if there are men out there that feel like they do not have a space, I encourage you to make your own space because really nothing is stopping any of us from building our own table. I also want to say that the two creators I have previously mentioned, I am also linking down below in the description in case you would like to go check out their channels or watch the videos that I've referenced. I would also like to start off this video with a bit of a fun fact that some of you may or may not know. I found it to be really interesting when I discovered this, and that is that the first image or the first reference we have of a witch riding a broom was actually a male witch. Now I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this name correctly so bear with me and if you know how to pronounce this name please let me know in the comment section down below. Gilame Edlin? I'm sorry I know I'm butchering that. Despite this the first witch to confess to riding a broom or besom was a man. Edlin was a priest from Saint Germain near Paris, and he was arrested in 1453 and tried for witchcraft after publicly criticizing the church's warnings about witches. Now, also down below, I'm going to link my source for that. If you would like to read more about that, feel free to check out that link there. Now, sometimes in my videos, I like to just kind of keep it casual and just kind of rant about whatever is on the top of my mind. But for this video, I really wanted to give the men their flowers and show some respect and present my thoughts in a well-formed manner. So I do have some notes here that I'm going to be referencing. So if you see me like looking down, it's because I'm looking at my notes. I wanna make sure that I touch on all of these points and I might deviate and rant a little bit here and there um, because I'm Jasmine and we have a squirrel brain and that's just what we do. So let's get into today's video, Men in the Craft. <laughs> Thing to kind of unpack here and something that I think a lot of men I have found sort of have a knee-jerk reaction to and that is the patriarchy and that is male privilege and my good sister girl Taya Kennedy made an amazing video regarding that that I'm also going to link down below you're going to find a lot of links down below um, I encourage you to go watch her video because I really do feel like she is presenting that so much more eloquently than I could um, but I'll kind of summarize it a little bit and give you my thoughts on it. And that is essentially that, you know, outside of the craft, in the Western world in general, it is very male dominated. Um, and that is a fact, right? Like, I don't think that's really something here to necessarily argue. So in the wider Western world, men have a lot of privilege simply just by being men, um, especially white men right? And with that privilege, I think that men in general are oftentimes used to just automatically being heard or listened to. And the thing about the craft is I feel like that privilege permeates it to a degree, and I'm going to get into why, but for the most part, I don't feel like in craft spaces that privilege is just automatically synonymous with having authority. And I think that's something that men in general sometimes just aren't used to. So when they're not given the authority automatically, when they're not given respect automatically simply for existing, it's kind of a little bit of a wake-up call. In Taya's video, she mentions about how male is kind of the default and how we call boats she and her and how we have a lot of gendered languages where the default is, for example, deodorant and then we have women's deodorant or we have razors and we have women's razors. We even have pens like writing utensils and then they're made pink and branded for women. We have waiters and actors that are then 
labeled as actresses and waitresses. So she brought up a lot of really good points there. I would recommend going to check out her video. Also another creator that I really, really vibe with that I discovered relatively recently through the hashtag Witches Black Lent is the activist witch who makes amazing content. And I highly recommend that you also fall down the rabbit hole on their channel too. I think another important thing to bring up when we are talking about where are the men in the craft or where are the men within pagan spaces, um, let's look to a lot of our founders. So many of the Western occult's world of witchery has been founded by men. Um, we look at Hermetics, we look at Gardnerianism, we look at Alexandrianism, we look at the Satanic era of the Satanic panic. And like all of these are very much being led by men. We have Anton LaVey, we have Gerald Gardner, we have Alex Sanders, we have Raven Gramassi. We have a lot of founding fathers. We have a lot of men that have started these witchcraft traditions that have wrote books and that have led community in one way or another. So there are men in the craft. And if you get into digging, especially into the grimoire traditions or looking into ceremonial magic, like I mentioned, hermeticism, high magic, you look into Agrippa, you look into the Picatrix or the Gael Thal Hakim, you look into the Pseudomonica Demonium, the Lesser and Greater Keys of Solomon, the Grimoire Verum, you're going to find men. And when we look at the magic of the Fertile Crescent, you know, cunning magic, uh, folk magic, oftentimes being dominated by women and midwives and being associated with low magic versus high magic, ceremonial magic, right? Um, the magis of the high courts advising kings and providing astrological predictions and insight for the nobility were typically men, very literate men. Men that had power, while they were not kings themselves, they were king makers. And they were not persecuted necessarily in the same way that the, the low magic practitioners were. Now, of course, that's not to say that men have not been tried for witchcraft. I believe it was Giles Corey, who was actually stoned to death. And I think one of his last words were like more stones. Um, look into that. Feel free to fact check me, but there are men that have been tried for witchcraft. So I'm not saying that there aren't, but I am saying that cunning women, low magic practitioners, um, that folk magic has been very dominated by medicine women, by midwives, and they have been very persecuted. You know, you deliver a baby that passes away and you're a witch. You, you offer a healing ointment or salve and it's witchcraft. You're a magus of the high royal court providing insight through astrological means um, to a king and you're an advisor. I also want to say that here in the Americas, um, Jake Richards wrote an amazing book called Backwoods Witchcraft, which references a lot of folk healing of Appalachia and Yarb doctors and these conjure workers, which a lot of them were men and they were not viewed as malevolent. They were viewed as healers and as wise men. And a lot of the folklore that is sprinkled throughout Appalachia, like Ole Miss Betsy, for example, is a wicked witch that lives down in the holler that summons spirits on a full moon. So I think that the perception of magic and power being filtered through the perception also of male or female really colors the conversation here, where while men have been persecuted, for magic, for the craft, I don't think it's to the same degree. And I, I would think that history and even folklore would kind of back me up a little bit there. Right. So tying this back to myself, um, I do not identify as a man, though I am a trans 
woman. I personally like to use the terminology trans woman. Being trans is something that I am proud of. I do think that there is a clear distinction between trans women and cis women. I, I think that we're both women. I don't think that we're necessarily the exact same. Um, and so when I was looking at this topic online, I found a good amount of men talking about this, of course. And I also found a good amount of women talking about this. But I felt kind of called to make this video as a trans woman because being trans, um, while I'm very femme, very she, her, um, and I transitioned quite young, so I don't have a lot of lived experience as man. Um, I think that I have a unique perspective on this because I do feel being trans, I am inherently connected to the liminal. And yeah, that's kind of what inspired me to talk about this because I saw a good amount of women um, talking about it, be it for or against men in the craft. And I sympathize with some men because as a trans woman myself, like I've mentioned, there have been times where I have been excluded, where I have been told there's not magic within me because as a woman who doesn't menstruate, I'm not magical. Or there's not magic within me because I don't have a womb. And so I'm not connected to women's mysteries. And I also wanna to say too, that I think menstruation is powerful. I think birthing humanity is amazing. And I don't wanna downplay the magical power of that either, but I'm just trying to provide a little bit of nuance, I think, in this conversation. Um, because if we swing too far in either of the sort of binaries here of, you know, the men have all the power, we're helpless women, fighting against this corrupt patriarchal system, which is true, right? And then on the other side of this, we have women saying that these are women's only mysteries, that it's connected to menstruation in the womb, and that this is a female only space, which I believe that they should be entitled to have those spaces. Do I personally agree with um, a lot of Z Budapests or Dianic Wicca in general? Yes and no, um, but I do believe that people should have the freedom and the authority to have their own space. I don't believe that that extends to the wider community. I don't believe that any high priest or high priestess or high priestix can tell someone that they can't be in the wider community. But keep in mind, a lot of covens specifically are extremely intimate, private, personal, and oftentimes um, events are held within coven members' personal houses. We don't have churches that we're facilitating these events for. This is happening you know, within the privacy of our own homes, this is happening within the intimate space that we create out in nature, right? So if someone doesn't want you in their house, you don't necessarily get to tell them that you're entitled to enter their room, right? You're welcome to be here in the community. So I respect um, women's only spaces and I respect women wanting to have women's only spaces, absolutely. But also recognize that there are men's only spaces as well. Look at the Minoan Brotherhood, for example, which is kind of a stark contrast to Dianic Wicca. That is exclusively a men's order. And I don't see women chomping at the bit and fighting to get in to the Minoan Brotherhood because that's not our space. So I'm currently editing this video right now. And I just want to point out when it comes to community and it comes to covenry, I want you to think about this like a neighborhood. And there's a whole witchcraft or pagan neighborhood. And there's different houses within the neighborhood that are gatekept by various groups and communities. And this is specifically a metaphor for magical orders. So if you're a solitary practitioner, I'm not excluding you from this, but this is what the metaphor entails. You are welcome in the neighborhood, but unless you have access to that particular coven, or community, um, you can't just break into someone's house. Um, there are doors and gates that exist for a reason, right? So gatekeeping is often this really negative sort of buzzword when 
it doesn't need to be and it shouldn't be um, because you're supposed to have locks on your door and they exist for a reason. So again, you're welcome in the wider neighborhood by all means. And if you don't find a house already established that you would like to be a part of, why not build your own house? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. So I see that as something very uniquely male as uh, I'm sorry, but a certain sense of entitlement to spaces is, in my opinion, very energetically male. And again, I want to touch on if you see a need, fill a need. If you are not seeing enough men represented in the wider community, or if you are not seeing enough men represented in your local community, ask yourself if you can step into that role. Ask yourself how you can facilitate, how you can trailblaze, and how you can create a space to let other people know that they are welcome in this community as well. So in my document that I'm going to be linking down below in case you would like to look at, I have a list of influential mighty dead men in the craft. And I want to say for those of you who might not be familiar with the term Mighty Dead, I'm specifically talking about those men who have contributed great deeds to the craft and have crossed the veil. So these are deceased. I have Robert Cochran, the craft of Tubal Cain, very influential in traditional witchcraft. Of course, we have Gerald Gardner, the Gardnerian. We have um, the Gardnerian Book of Shadows, along with a lot of other work and a whole tradition. And same with Robert Cochran, right? We have Alex Sanders, who is the Alexandrian HP, right? Who wrote King of the Witches, who kind of co-started with Maxine Sanders, this whole tradition that exists today. We have Andrew Chumbly, um, very influential in traditional witchcraft, very influential in sabbatic craft as well. Israel Rigardi, who wrote The Middle Pillar, very influential in witchcraft, hermeticism, ceremonial magic, and that book, The Middle Pillar, is still referenced today. Anton LaVey, some people love him, some people hate him, some people debate his true association with the craft. However, I would like to remind you that he did write a book called Satanic Witch, and he also wrote the Satanic Bible. And so whether or not Anton identified himself as a witch or Levian Satanists see themselves as witches, I think that the sort of association there um, still leaves an impact. And so I wanted to include him in this list. Another controversial figure that we of course have to bring up, Aleister Crowley, um, love him, hate him, whatever you feel about him. This video is not intended to be a critique on the contents of their character, more so just acknowledging the contributions that these men have made and left an impact. So I understand that some of these men I've even already mentioned people have strong feelings about. I do myself as well. Um, I'm not saying that I am a stan of any of these folks, but I am saying that these are people that have ultimately left an impact on the craft community. And I think that we need to address them, say their names, recognize their work. And even if there are aspects that we don't agree with, I think by studying their teachings, by learning, their sacred work and systems, we can understand and unpack what does work for us and what is maybe outdated that we need to leave behind. And Aleister Crowley for me is definitely one of those examples. Um, Aleister Crowley was also a bit of a cross-dresser, so I guess we have, you know, some representation there, be it not the greatest, but we have the Book of the Law and we have an entire tradition of Thelema, um, which massively influential even still to this day, lots of work with the Red Goddess and Babylon, and Aleister Crowley kind of broke away from the Golden Dawn and really trailblazed this whole new system. Also have Raven Gramassi, um, rest his soul, very influential Italian Americano style practitioner who really brought Italian witchcraft, I feel like, um, to the forefront in the West and the whole tradition of Strigeria um, and all of that. I encourage you also, as I'm reading this list, to um, check out my document or take your own notes and go look at some of these folks. Fine with Italian witchcraft, we also have Charles Godfrey Leland, who was a folklorist and maybe a witch. 
Charles Godfrey Leland sort of translated the Vangelo into Aradia, the Gospel of Witches, that we all know and love today within the grimoire traditions, and is very influential within neo-paganism. Um, the charge of Diana to Aradia, the charge of Aradia to the people, both of those very influential in Western esotericism, witchcraft. Um, we have the charge of the goddess by Doreen Valiente that is very, very similar. Many systems have pulled from from the Gospel of Witches. I myself am a votary of Aradia, and I have some content here on my channel and on my Patreon as well um, of works that I have done within this system and tradition. I also have an annotated version of the Gospel of Witches that I plan to be releasing this year with all of my thoughts about the Gospel along with some neo-traditional things that I will be including to sort of really flesh out more of this neo-tradition. Another one, Lovecraft. Was he a practitioner? Was he not a practitioner? You know, uh, don't necessarily uh, super, super think the guy was amazing for various reasons, but I do see that eldritch influence, even in the modern craft. I see so many witches referencing the Necronomicon as if it is some sort of Bible and working with it in a way that they view as legitimate. Think that we should definitely mention Stuart Farrar, um, who co-wrote the Witch's Bible. Um, that book, for me, was very influential early on in my practice. I remember finding that book, I believe, as a teenager and seeing the images of real witches working real ceremonial magic and how blown away that I was. Um, feel how you want about Janet and about Stuart. I think that that work was massively influential. And I think that when we're talking about men in the craft, I think that Alex Sanders' name should definitely be in that list. Of course, we have Scott Cunningham. People, even today, when I'm filming this, still recommend Scott Cunningham's work massively influential, especially amongst solitary witches. I believe Scott Cunningham wrote that big green book, right? The Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs. Um, Scott was really known for his magical correspondence books and really changed the game, I would say, in the witch world, especially here in the West. And then we have Eddie Buxnaksky. Don't know if I'm saying that right, probably not, forgive me. Um, but the Minoan Brotherhood, like I had mentioned earlier, Eddie and the strong associations with that specific men's only order. And I believe also for gay and bisexual men specifically for even more representation. Now this next one could be a mighty dead depending on how you view it. Um, but I wanted to include him and that would be King Solomon himself. Um, Solomonic magic, whole system and tradition that some allege to be traced back to King Solomon himself. And we have the lesser and the greater keys along with the Testament of Solomon. Um, he's kind of a mythical sort of figure. Many people recognize him from Abrahamic texts where he commanded the angels to enslave demons to bring him power and build his empire. It's a very interesting story. Whether or not you subscribe to it in a literal sense, I think that it's something important to read about and learn about. Um, at the very least, it's interesting. And if you are interested in the left-hand path or demonology, demonolatry, the Goetia, I think that you will find a lot of benefit by studying the life and lessons and testament of Solomon along with works that are associated with his character. Okay, now I want to get into some modern influential men in the craft. At the top of my list would be George Hares, wrote Barbarous Words, fantastic creator here on YouTube that you can go check out as well. I will try to remember to leave a link, um, but very influential, especially amongst trad craft style witches. So Michael Herkes, who I was fortunate enough to actually have here on my channel, um, wrote The Glam Witch, The Greater Lilithian Arcane Mysteries. We've got a lot of queer representation with Michael as well. Strongly recommend that if you are interested in Lilith, um, that you check out The Glam Witch. We have none other than the Keldon Mercury himself, which I've also been fortunate enough to have on my channel. Um, Keldon wrote The Crooked Path, arguably probably one of the most influential um, books in modern craft, especially amongst American traditional witches. Um, I know that The Crooked Path that Keldon wrote completely revolutionized my personal practice. And his other book, The Witch's Sabbath, 
absolutely amazing look academically and historically at the Witch's Sabbath. If you are interested in learning more of that sort of folklore and magical associations with the Sabbath. Roger J. Horn, another really amazing um, author, wrote The Witch's Devil and 13 Gates of Witch Flight. Highly, highly recommend. I found a lot of inspiration both in Keldon's work and George's work and also in Roger J. Horn's work in regards to my own book, Ambrosia's Book of Witch Flight. Um, and I cite a lot of their work in my work because their books completely changed my practice. And these are men in the craft. Oh my gosh, I don't think that we could talk about men in the craft without talking about Christopher Penzak. Um, the inner and outer temple of witchcraft. Hello. Also, how about gay witchcraft? Like, check out that book if you have not already. Matt Ahrens, Psychic Witch, I think kind of broke the internet for a bit and made a big splash in the witch community. Um, if you are interested in developing your psychic abilities and psych psychic skills, if you are, I would say, newer to the psychic world, clairaudience, clairsentience, clairgustance. I think that Psychic Witch is a book that I find myself recommending uh, people newer to the path or people interested in developing their own psychic abilities. Um, it's a very well uh, rated book, so check it out. Also on this list, Devin Hunter and The Witch's Book of Power. Check out that work as well. I think the next two that I have on my list, I think that people are either going to love or hate, have strong opinions about, whatever. Um, and that would be Brian Kane, who is an Alexandrian high priest, wrote Initiation into Witchcraft. I actually have his book on my bookshelf back here. And I listened to it as an audiobook when I went out to Missouri. I really enjoyed his work. Um, and I would recommend checking that out. And then we have Christian Day and the Witch's Book of the Dead. Um, lots of necromancy tea going on there. Both of these gentlemen are Alexandrians and are modern witches. Very active online. I enjoy um, Brian's podcast, Covendom, um, a lot. Um, while there might be some things that I find myself disagreeing with, I think that they are very educated and I enjoy listening to them, along with Levi Rowland as well, who I have in included in my list. Levi Rowland um, with the book Mother Ecstasy Transformation, The Great Goddess. Go check them out. Another amazing creator to just listen to. Um, I saw Levi's video on Facebook sort of talking about the occulty hashtag trend and about religious leadership within the craft and how we do but don't have it and the implications of that. So I would recommend going and finding that video and giving it a listen because there's a lot of really good points that Levi makes there. Toby Michael and The Poison Path. What an amazing book on Vinicium and working with Athenogens and flying ointments. I mean, I don't know who else I would recommend possibly more than Kobe's work on that. And I believe Kobe also has some courses available if you are interested in working with poisonous plants and making your own ointments and salves for witch flight. I referenced Kobe's work in my own work and highly, highly uh, regard Kobe Michael. Also, Marshall, The Witch of Southern Light. Our book club is actually currently reading Marshall's book, um, Cunning Words, and I'm really excited to get into it with the book club. I think that they are very much a influential figure within the modern occult world, and all of their Instagram posts also are just absolutely sickening. 10 out of 10 recommend. If you don't know The Witch of Southern Light, I'm gonna need you to know. Also, Jake Richards, like I mentioned before, Backwoods Witchcraft, really breaking down folklore, history, and practices of the Appalachian region. Also have his book on my shelf. That was another book that our book club did. And in that same vein, Aaron Oberon, Southern Cunning, Breaking Down Magic and Witchcraft of the Deep South. Another book that I have on my bookshelf. It's another book that our uh, book club voted on as the community choice pick. Both of them, I think, are very influential in the modern craft world. Christopher Opello co-wrote Besom Sword and Stang, which is a marvelous uh, traditional witchcraft book. Presents a lot of really great points like the Sixfold Path and really looking at some traditional witchcraft from more of an atheistic perspective as well. I actually did a whole book report on this for the Red Thread Academy. I really enjoyed it and I find myself referencing it a lot. Um, and I believe that Christopher 
also has a YouTube channel. Um, for some of these creators that have channels that I'm mentioning, I will see if I can link them down below in the description, but I make no promises on that. Also, an influential man in the craft currently would have to be Craig Spencer. Um, I've just read this book again. Um, as I am a votary of Aradia, working within the Red Thread Academy, I'm reading a lot on Aradian mysteries as I am preparing my own Aradian grimoire. And Craig Spencer wrote this awesome book on the modern Aradia. Um, I really enjoy it. You know, Craig presents his own revelations in terms of the sacred text, the Gospel of Witches, and really breaking it down in extreme nuance. And there's a lot that I agree with that Craig has written in there. There's some things that, like, I don't, but that doesn't mean that Craig is not an amazing author and very influential within the modern craft world. Also, I think that we could just broadly sort of gesture at the Golden Dawn and Hermeticism for sort of a boys club. I think that that's changing now more and more. I'm seeing more girly pops uh, participating in Hermeticism, but I mean, that's kind of been like a boys club. A lot of it has been very fraternal historically. And also, like I've mentioned before, when I was talking about Eddie and the Minoan Brotherhood and an entire order designated for bi and uh, gay men um, in magic as a initiatory system. So if you'd like more information about that, I do have a link down below that's in my notes that you can go check out and fall down that rabbit hole. I am also going to be listing some other videos from creators here on YouTube that have talked about their experience as male witches or just the topic of men and the craft um, that I'm going to include down below. And I would like to just kind of extend this as an open sort of community tag. Um, let's use the hashtag men in the craft if you would like to kind of create a style of video talking about this and how you feel about men in the craft. Do they belong? Do they not belong? Their influence, your experience, whatever it might be, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, I would encourage you to maybe like be nice, um, but I guess you don't really have to necessarily either, like pop off, slay king. And yeah, so I think overall my thoughts are men are everywhere in the craft and have been everywhere in the craft. And while there might be some spaces that tend to be women's only spaces, be it cis, trans, neither or both, that doesn't mean that men are not here. That doesn't mean that men are not heard necessarily either. We have so many influential authors that are men that have written these books. We have so many founding fathers that have created entire traditions of magic um, that are men. And I know that when we go to a pagan pride, right, you might see a lot, a lot of women, but that doesn't mean that men are not there. And when it comes to representation, again, I think that if you see a need, fill a need. And I know that not all of us are capable of fulfilling that, but I myself, as a trans woman, I'm looking at occultists and witches throughout history that were trans and um, coming up with a lot of blank spaces, which is unfortunate. And I feel like that weight is sort of placed on my shoulders to trailblaze. And I'm not saying that I'm the only magical practitioner that's a trans woman, okay? Definitely not saying that. And I also don't necessarily wanna be the mouthpiece for the community. So I relate to some men that feel like um, they don't want to take on that responsibility, but this is kind of my video on men and the craft. I think my closing thoughts on it are men have always been here in the craft. Um, men have also a lot of power and influence here in the craft. Um, and while there might be spaces that are not made for men, that does not mean that the wider community itself is unwelcoming. Um, and that's not to say that your personal experiences aren't like valid. I'm No one can tell you how you feel is right or wrong, but I'm hoping that by presenting the information in this way, it will kind of demonstrate just how many men there really are. Because I am aware that sometimes uh, with the amount of women that are in this community, it can seem like it's completely female dominated. Um, but I really, I just don't think that that is the case. I don't think that our liturgy supports that notion. And I think that anyone who is perpetuating the idea that men are not welcome or that men are not in the craft or that men are not witches, um, 
is at least not very well read. I'll say that at best. So anyway, that is going to be the end of this video. I hope that you all are well and stay well and stay blessed. Um, we are approaching the spring equinox. I know I cannot wait to have some warmer weather and some more light. Like I feel my seasonal depression leaving my body. And until next time, you all, blessed be, and I will see you in hell. I got the cash in the bag, stadium pack Born a rock star in this life, gone live it up on the attack Baby, I'm bad, I just wanna get caught up in this life I'm crazy, I'm mad, doing no cap Only God wants you, better go live it up Cash in the bag, stadium pack Baby, I'm bad, yeah. baby, I'm bad I just wanna stay bad, stay mad, shit by my shoulder Cause they treat me like an outcast I ain't gonna take that, stay back I'll be swinging hard till the hits come in all caps I ain't gonna lay back, pray that someone's gonna help me Ain't nobody like that I ain't gonna wait, that's all fact Give me one shot and I'll never get the throne back